911 emergency, what are you reporting? Um, help. This is 911, do you have an emergency? Uh, I just went away from home because I lived in a family of 15, okay? Can you hear me? And we have abusing parents. Did you hear that? Okay, how did they abuse you? Okay. They hit us, they throw us across, they like to throw us across the room. They pull our hair, they, they yank out our hair. I have two, my two little sisters right now are chained up. Okay, how Did old you are you? I'm 17. What's your name? Golden Turpin. What's your address? Okay, you got to give me a minute. This is going to take a while. I've never been out. I don't go out much, so I don't know anything about the streets or anything. Does anybody at the house take any kind of medication? Oh, uh, I don't know what medication is. Webster's Dictionary defines family as a social group made up of parents and their children, a group of people who come from the same ancestor, a group of people living together, a household. Others define family as a group of two or more persons related by birth, marriage, or adoption that live together. Blood bound or not, family is the people you reign from. They are to protect you, educate you, encourage you, love you, support you, and nurture you into the best possible human you can be. Those are who we define as their family. But for the Turpin family, the word means something different. David and Louise Turpin have 13 children, raised Pentecostal. Having many children is something that their faith led them to do, so they say. For the 13 children who were rescued from the House of Horrors in Paris, California, law enforcement with Riverside, California performed a welfare check on the home after a call came in from one of the children who resided in the home. What they found once the door was opened by Louise would forever change the way they protect and serve. It forever changes the value of family to them and left them with a smell they can never forget. Of the 13 children or victims, they found one shackled to the bed. Another one weighed no more than 82 pounds, and it was later found out she was 29 years old. No longer a dependent by any definition of the word to David and Louise. Yet their hold on their children was far more sinister than originally thought, as more and more were found to be above the age of 18 were pulled from that home being neglected and abused. The youngest was the only one found to not be abused and malnourished at the hands of David and Louise. The family next door turned to be something far more as this house of horror came in to the spotlight. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight, we embark on a different kind of crime here on TTCL, one with victims who live to tell the tale of what exactly it was like to be the children of David and Louise Turnpin. Every year in the United States, more than 4 million referrals come into the Child Protective Services on 4.3 million children. Of that, on average, five lose their life every single day to child abuse and neglect. In the world, over one billion children are seen abused and neglected. This number is far too high. Children are our tomorrow, and we are losing them to adults who thrive on the fact that they are superior and can do the most brutal things, all because they don't want to the child or the children, but refuse to let someone who does take them. Parenting is not for everyone, and tonight I introduce you to two people who were not cut out to be parents to one child, let alone 13. Warning. 
This episode contains graphic detail of sexual abuse, child abuse, neglect, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel like any of this will be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you. Good evening, all of my true crime nerds, and welcome to the final series of season four here on TTCL. It's been a crazy season, and we've covered some shocking cases here. Like last year, I will be breaking for the summer months. My job ramps up in June, and I'm a crazy busy as a mom, as a librarian, so it's just easier for me to take that month just to focus on everything else I have on my plate. Make sure you stick with me on social media following TTCL and over on Patreon where I still plan on doing the bonus show. And I know I haven't put out an episode in a hot minute, but I do plan to be back on top of that as we go into the warmer months. And of course, be on the lookout for a surprise or two this summer. Season 5 kicks off the second anniversary of the show where we will be covering international cases exclusively. So if you have one you want seen covered here on TTCL, drop me a line on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or shoot me an email on a case or cases you would like me to cover. You never know, they may just make the lineup for Season 5. I do want to make sure that I'm clear up until now, I've only covered or strictly covered stateside cases, and I want to incorporate international cases into that lineup in the years to come, and I couldn't think of a better way to do so than to dedicate an entire season to international true crime. So join me as I cross the pond to bring you the cases you want to hear. Tonight, I want to spread some true crime nerd love to all the moms out there for Mother's Day. Moms can be the unsung heroes in our lives. They work from the moment those feet hit the ground in the morning until she puts her head down on the pillow at night. So make sure you call your mom, your mom's friends, and don't forget those grandmas and let them know just how much you appreciate their love and support. All right. Now, enough of the housekeeping. Let's get to what you all came here for, the true crime. Let me introduce you to the Turpin family. To know David is to know the family that he came from. He isn't the first in his lineage to be accused of neglect or child abuse. That goes as far back as his great-grandfather, King Joshua Turpin Sr., King Turpin Singer, he was David's great-grandfather. Yeah, we are going that far back in this case. He was known for being a strict disciplinarian. He would go on to father seven children and have four wives, not all of them at the same time. But the direct lineage that we are going to focus on is King Jr. or Little King. 
Little King and His Sister Minnie. This story comes from the book that I am reading for this case. And um, although there were seven children in Senior's lifetime, Little King and Minnie seemed to have grown up around the same time. And they were the ones being chased through the house by Senior with either a white hot poker or he would throw rocks as he chased the two. When he did catch up with them, they would receive a brutal whipping for whatever transgression he declared they committed. Both Junior and Minnie would lose privileges to their shoes only to be handed them back for church on Sunday. Once they were home from church, they surrendered their shoes and they would not earn them back until they, quote, learned to behave. Junior and Minnie were not settling for a father that, like Senior, they knew life was supposed to be better than this. And Senior often was leaving Junior and Minnie at home alone for two, three weeks at a time as he and his wives would travel to make money so the family could scrape by. So during these times, Junior and Minnie would try to run away, often to neighbors. And when they'd get there, the neighbors would go and call their father to come get them. Then they would go even further the next time, and the same thing was happening. Every time, Senior would be called to come get his kids. And when Junior and Minnie got home, it was time for their whipping. In 1915, Tennessee Welfare Authorities, which was pretty equivalent to today's Child Protective Services, intervened and they took Junior and Minnie from the home. The two were sent to two separate orphanages and Junior was quickly placed under his uncle's care and Minnie was at another orphanage and she wasn't as lucky. She bounced around from one orphanage to another. Two years before family finally stepped up to claim her. But her future looked quite different than her brother's. Minnie was pregnant by the age of 13. King Jr. moved to Knoxville, Tennessee at the age of 18. And at first he was working in cotton mills before he married Nellie Griggs and they welcomed their first child together, a daughter. Shortly after switching over to being in the coal mines, the daughter passed away after accidentally ingesting calcium carbide. Calcium carbide is used to light his headlamp. It's this that, it's this event that would lead King Jr. to the Pentecostal faith after attending a prayer meeting in Lynch. From then on, he was a devout servant of his faith, and he became what is called a lay preacher. These are people who are proclaimed to be a preacher of the faith, but are never officially ordained by the clerk. In 1927, Junior and Nellie welcomed their fourth child, a son, who they would lose very early in his life to gastroenteritis, or the stomach flu. On the death certificate, the doctor did feel compelled to note that, quote, the family never gave medication as they believed in divine healing. Basically, they prayed over their son, believing that if he was worthy, God would heal him from his illness with a miracle. Well, it didn't work, and they were left with a dead child. Junior would then move his family over to Arizona, spreading the Pentecostal faith and speaking in tongues before he would turn around and tell his congregation what he interpreted to that. In 1932, he moved them back to West Virginia, where Nellie would pass after childbirth. She was giving birth to a set of twins. Well, it wasn't soon that Junior was marrying 16-year-old Bertha Lee Church. As a matter of fact, he traded his car for the 16-year-old, and Bertha often said that without it, her father would have never let her marry a man like King Jr. Bertha and Jr. would welcome 
a son, James Jim Randolph Turpin. He is David's father. Jim followed his faith just as his father, just as Junior had, and he got a call from the altar, which basically said he had been saved. In June of 1955, Jim married 17-year-old Betty Rose, and the two settled down in Princeton, West Virginia, in the heart of the Appalachia Jewel of the South. May 1958, Jim and Betty would welcome their first son, James Randolph, or Randy Turpin. Three years later, they welcomed their second and final son, David Allen Turpin, on October 17th of 1961. In the summers, Randy and David would travel to Junior, King Junior, and his wife's home, and he played an important role in developing David and Randy's faith. He instilled in them the Pentecostal faith. Every Sunday, the Turpin family attended church at the Princeton Church of God on Oliver Avenue. And this is the very same church that a family known as the Robinettis attended. Wayne or Allen was the preacher and the two families grew up together, putting a very young Louise Robinetti growing up with David Turpin, who was seven years her senior. When David got to junior high, that's when he started to kind of stand out a little bit. Most kids in junior high are still trying to figure out who they are as far as style, personality, beliefs, all of that go. Well, in 1970s, kids had longer hair. They wore bell bottoms. They were very open and loving to everything. But for David, it was different. David had shorter hair. He dressed very conservative conservatively. His faith had a very modest dress code, but for David, it was wearing suits to school, and this sometimes meant he wore a bow tie, especially if he was trying to make a statement. David is a very intelligent person, and he was quiet and standoffish, and he loved to play chess. It was something that his classmates spoke about him after hearing the news of his crimes many years later in the media. If all of this didn't describe an awkward preteen, then let me add that in junior high, David stood nearly six foot tall. Many of us remember back to our time in junior high where all the boys were still the same height they were in fifth grade. On November 27th, 1977, King Jr. passed away after being in the hospital for a few weeks dealing with his failing health. This was hard on David and his older brother Randy because Jr. had become extremely influential in both of their lives and their faith. Come high school, David traded in his suits and bow ties for something a bit more comfortable blue jeans, and a Spock-like haircut. David was a very big Star, or David is a very big Star Trek fan, but especially in his teen years. He was very active in clubs around the school. He became the treasurer of the Bible club. Uh, some of the duties included like ringing the bell for Salvation Army, serving Thanksgiving to other underprivileged families and organizing Christmas parties. And I, I really harp on these activities because this shows a lot about the Pentecostal faith. And as I myself am not Pentecostal, so I find it extremely interesting when I'm looking at a case that has religion uh, playing a major role, I like to learn about what each faith tells you to do. That's why I think it's important to bring that in so you really understand who David is and what he believed in. David was also the co-captain of the chess team. He had once beat somebody within the first three moves of the game. He was a member of the Science and Spanish Club, and he sang a cappella for the school's choir. 
outside of school, he really liked to work on cars with his dad. David had a Honda Civic that he loved to tune with and mess with. Well, one of his little projects were he and his father installed air horns on the Civic. And on Friday and Saturday nights, when everyone was cruising up and down the streets in their cars, David would like to scare people with the air horns. He had a great sense of humor compared to who he was described as in junior high. And I pictured this in my head and it makes me giggle every time <laughs> it makes me laugh because I can just see him doing him driving up and down the street blowing this 18 wheeler air horn at you David graduated with a 95.6585 grade point average it landed him the coveted scholarship for studying electrical engineering at Virginia Tech. In his senior year, David decided that he wanted to be an engineer, and this was her, his one and only career path. David was also awarded a top 20 award. It's around this time, David says that he started having feelings for a very young 10-year-old Louise Ann Robinetti. Let me introduce you to Louise Ann Turnpin. And if David's family didn't show you enough signs leading to where David Turpin is now, then let me add in Miss Louise Ann Turpin's family life. Her maternal grandfather, John Thomas Taylor, was a decorated World War II veteran and a member of the Church of God, and when he came home in December of 45, attending church, he would meet his wife, Mary Louise Harmon, in the Princeton Church of God. The two would soon marry and would welcome four children in their life together. Eugene, Glenn, Phyllis, and James. Phyllis being the one and only daughter of this veteran. He soon became a pillar of the community and he would go on to open a Shell gas station in Mercer County. It was a rocking and successful little station. It was also the only place you could get gas around the area, so you didn't have much of a choice. Taylor became known for his eccentric tendencies, especially with his women clientele. He always lingered when touching the girls, like if they were switching money out, his hand lingered in their hand. It would caress their hand and it really freaked out the women and they aptly named him a creepy person. Most women hated to have to go to the gas station without their husbands and many forced their children to hand him the money, hoping their innocence would keep the creepy thing at bay. Unfortunately, Taylor wasn't biased about age. He creeped out the younger female customers, too. There is an allegation that says a female student worked for him one summer, and during that time, Taylor molested her during her employment. No formal charges were ever brought against Taylor from this person. Taylor's station would rise to fame for another reason besides his excessive sexual weird freaky things on monday january 3rd 1966 a tank truck driver was at his station offloading fuel into the tanks the driver decided he was going to take a break and stepped away from the area but apparently not far enough to have a smoke break supposedly the fumes ignited setting a 38 year old driver on fire he would later succumb to those injuries in just a few days. While Taylor was a decorated war hero, a pillar of the community, his butt was in the pew every Sunday, his family in tow, but behind all of that, behind closed doors, he was sexually abusing his one and only daughter, Phyllis. The girl was very desperate uh, and getting away from her father and his constant sexual desires. 
Telling her mother what he was doing was not an option. She feared that she would say something and she wouldn't be believed. So what was the point? At 17, Phyllis started dating Alan or Wayne to those who knew him, Robinetti. He was just 19. Come July 20th, 1967, Wayne and Phyllis filed for their marriage license, leading them to have a ceremony on July 29th, just nine days later. The successful station owner walked his one and only daughter down the aisle to marry. She had found her way out. Her father couldn't hurt her anymore. So she thought. On May 24th, 1968, exactly nine months following the wedding, Wayne and Phyllis welcomed their very first child, a daughter, who they named Louise Ann Robinetti after her mother and Louise's grandmother. Louise was christened at the Princeton Church of God, where she would meet the man she would later marry. Louise was the oldest of six children. Thanks to the abuse that Phyllis suffered as a child at the hands of her own father, she had little to no interest in actually being a mother, so it was left up to Louise to take care of her younger sisters. Wayne and Phyllis were not exactly the best partners. The two argued constantly, knocked down dragouts. Starting when Louise was young, Phyllis would take... Louise to John Taylor's house for a visit. And I can't help but speculate that the, the constant fighting between Wayne and Phyllis was because they needed money. Because during these visits, John would take time with his young granddaughter and he would do what he called tight hugs. And Phyllis turned a blind eye knowing what her father was doing, but it meant that he would give her the money. Phyllis was essentially selling her daughter's innocence to her very predator dad. Unfortunately, all of Louise's sisters were molested by their grandfather at some point in their life. Louise wasn't very much different than her husband when she was in school. She was quiet, she didn't have many friends, and she often isolated herself from classmates. In 1982, the abuse that Phyllis went through and then allowed her daughter Louise to go through came to a head when Mary Louise, the grandmother, John's wife, walked into the room and found him raping their 14-year-old granddaughter Louise. Finally, what had been happening behind closed doors was going to come to light. Mary filed for divorce from John right away, and he moved from the home to one behind the station. And in with days of them filing for divorce, Mary and John Robinetti dissolved their marriage. Again, no charges were filed. The Robinetti family was well known in the community. And since John had all the money, it was decided by Mary Louise that she would not cause that level of scandal. But that also meant that John would pay her what she needed when she needed it kind of thing. So essentially, Mary sold her daughter and granddaughter's innocence as well. Unfortunately, Phyllis didn't stop taking her daughters to go see John. And the youngest of her girls was only one at the time that John and Mary's divorce came about. So there were three older daughters that had all been molested by John when the news broke that that's what he was doing because her fourth daughter was only one, but she would also be a, be a victim of John's sexual abuse in her life later. In 1983, 15 year old Louise began dating 22 year old David Turpin. Phyllis took the news of the David and Louise dating well having always thought he was a good kid. However, her father, Wayne, mm, he had been kept in the dark about much of this relationship because they did not think he would approve his daughter dating a man seven years older than her. 
Louise revealed to her sister that she was going to marry David and together they would have 12 children. He was going to be an engineer making $100,000 a year. She would never want for anything again. I want to stop here and insert that it's not uncommon for women who are victims of abuse as a child to marry men who they know are predators themselves. It's what they know. It's how they know how to act. And they can't seem to see the same as somebody looking from the situation on the outside could see. It's not uncommon. And all of that is what a an abused person is left to deal with once the abuse stops or that's how they choose to get out of the abuse by trading one abuser for another. At this point, David is driving back and forth from Virginia Tech to Princeton so that he can see Louise. If Wayne knew about Louise and David seeing each other, each other, he would make them sit in the same room as other people. They would not be allowed to be what teenage, well, he's a young adult, what these two would be like in the beginning of a relationship. That was not going to be allowed. So it was just better if they didn't tell Wayne that she was seeing him on the weekends. At Virginia Tech, David's smarts were starting to play off for him. He joined Etta Kappa Nu, an elite international electrical and computer engineering honor society, and some of its members have included Steve Wozniak, Larry Page, he's the founder of Google, Eric Schmidt, he's the CEO of Google, and Sabir Bahati of Yahoo. David was padding his educational resume to set him up for once he graduated with his degree, and this would help him land big-time jobs later in life. David had his future set out. It was planned, and he was just shy of executing it all. David and Louise were encouraged to date Phyllis. She would allow them to go off to be by themselves together, even though there is a seven-year age difference. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, age is, is just a number. You're right, but when you're 15 and 7 and 22, that's not just a number. Okay, now if she was 18 and they were, he was 25, okay, a little weird, but okay. But 15 and 22 is just, that's not just a number. In 1984, as Louise was entering into 10th grade and being named vice president of the Bible Club, David was graduating from Virginia Tech. He was awarded the Marshall Hahn Engineering Scholarship. And he was already submitting his beautifully padded resumes to companies across the country. Louise may have been the dutiful daughter of a Christian family doing all that she knew to do that would please her parents, but behind closed doors, she was doing and getting whatever she wanted. She would sneak around and lie, all in the name of getting exactly what she wanted. Later, David accepts a position in Fort Worth, Texas, as a U.S. defense contractor of General Dynamics. This meant that if he was going to keep Louise, the two were going to have to elope. And since Louise wanted nothing more than to marry David, she snuck around behind everyone's back in order to make sure this happened. She was gung-ho. She didn't need to be told twice. She was going to do whatever it took to leave this life behind and start another where the man she loved would give her all the things she was only ever able to dream about. It's speculated that the reason that Louise latched on to David was because it was a way for her to get away from her grandfather and the abuse she was suffering in the name of her mom getting money. Again, this is trading one predator for another. If Louise was in 
within earshot of her sisters when they would visit John and hear that word tight hug, she would volunteer to take those their places. She was compelled to take care of them. She raised them because her mother wasn't the mothering type. But I'm not going to say that Louise was any better at being a mother e either, or I wouldn't be covering her case right here on TTCL. But let, Louise was putting herself into situations where the abuse was occurring frequently and not seeing what could come from that seven year difference between her and David was a way for her to pick and choose the scenario she wanted. This allows her to trade one in for another. Mary does find out that Phyllis is still taking the granddaughters to John's house for money. Even though Mary had divorced her husband over this, she couldn't believe that her daughters were still allowing the abuse to occur. And she demanded her daughter to make it stop. But when looking at what Phyllis went through and where she had come out as an adult, the emotional trauma kept her from seeing what long-term effects were occurring to, to if she continued to allow this abuse to occur. She didn't see it. She didn't know what it was going to do to her children ultimately in life as an adult. Come mid-July of 1985, David has devised this plan for the couple to lope and start a life of their own. The day before they were set to leave, Louise called her sister into her room and she's busily packing a duffel bag. She's only taking with her the things she absolutely wanted to have. She swore the sister to see Gritsy, you know, don't say anything. She had already been keeping this plan a secret far long enough, but she wanted to let her sister know that she was going to be okay. And the two ended up going to bed like nothing happened or like nothing was coming. The next morning, both girls go to school, Louise with her duffel bag full of her belongings. And the plan was David pose as Louise's father and sign her out of school. And by the time that anyone realized what had happened, the two could be long gone. That morning, Louise excuses herself from class around three or four times. The nerves are starting to get the best of her. And she's obsessively checking to see if David has gotten there. And after the third or fourth time, Louise didn't come back. Her teacher asked classmates if Louise had been sick or was getting sick when somebody else revealed the plan. Quote, she was running off and getting married to David Turpin, end quote. David donned a fake mustache and a cowboy hat and went through with his plan like he had laid out. He demanded that his daughter Louise leave with him immediately as he was Mr. Alan Robinetti. And at that period of time what questions were asked you're the dad you're the dad this obviously would not fly in today's time with the ramped up security measures at school for this reason exactly and for the safety of outsiders coming in due to school shootings being on the rise when louise didn't return home from school that day phyllis drove to the school thinking Louise had simply just missed the bus, but she found out her daughter had been removed from instruction early that morning by a man who said he was Alan Robinetti. Well, Wayne flips out when Phyllis calls asking, you know, why did you pull Louise from school today? Neither parent was aware of David's plan and now their daughter was God only knows where with God only knows who. Louise Ann Robinetti was reported missing that evening. Both parents blamed one another, Phyllis, for encouraging the relationship that obviously led to Louise running away, and Wayne for being too close-minded and leaving 
Louise is the only option to run away instead of, you know, her dad making them separate. So threatening the Turpin family with legal action as technically David is an adult who essentially kidnapped a 16-year-old and now he was transporting her across state lines. That's kidnapping, federal kidnapping. That's not a, a charge you just, you know, like, I got pulled over. This is something that completely kill his career plans. So in the end, Louise is picked up um, in Fort Worth. And this is where the threat of the charges first stem from. And surprisingly, it's Phyllis who's pushing for them. In the end, both families decided that it would be best if they just allowed the two to quietly marry. Extramarital sex is extremely, extremely frowned upon in their faith. And whether the family liked it or not, this was ultimately going to happen if they kept trying to keep the two from one another. So on February 11th, 1985, Louise and David married in a small quiet church ceremony in Petersburg, Virginia, about 35 miles from their hometown, Princeton. Only close family was in attendance, and Miss Louise wore a conservative mid calf white dress that had a, like, mock turtle neckline, and David wore an ill-fitting three-piece brown suit with a striped tie and his well-known quirky grin. Following the wedding, David and Louise get to return to Fort Worth, and he is starting his new job, the very one that Louise guaranteed would allow her to have and buy whatever she wanted. At this time, Louise was still communicating with her sisters, but for all intents and purposes, she blamed the rest of the family for continuously allowing John, her grandfather, to sexually abuse her throughout her childhood and into her teen years. And she resented them for not pressing charges against him and instead choosing to sweep it under the rug to avoid scandal. You can't help but wonder what would have happened had they reported the abuse to authorities and chose to seek help as a family to heal from what John Taylor had done to all the younger females in their family. Would Louise have been so desperate to leave, therefore settling with all that David had to offer? Would she have seen in David what she witnessed in her grandfather's eyes? Would, would the Turpin and Robinani family have a completely different outcome? You can't help but I ask all these questions each and every time you look back and went, had you done it this way, life could have changed drastically for everyone. In Fort Worth, David was in the early days of his new career, one that he worked hard at getting, and the two were making good money for being newlyweds. David was working on the F-16 Fighting Falcon. It was a popular military supersonic jet fighter, and it allowed him to make quite a bit of money. The young couple liked to spend it by attending frequent pricier restaurants around the DFW area. They really enjoyed to go down to the Fort Worth stockyards, and if you don't know what they are, the stockyards are filled with many things to do, but notably, they have very popular bars in the area. They also like to go to rodeos and Wild West shows. In 1987, the couple made their first move to give David even more opportunities in his career. They moved out to Brea, California. You may have said that wrong. Somebody will correct me. Orange County had tons of attractions and it offered a great deal of things for the couple to do and spend their wealthy paychecks on. Even though Louise was really holding on to that grudge and it divided her away from her family, she still needed to boast about her life. So she frequently wrote home 
to her sisters describing what life was like. She was living the California dream, Disneyland whenever she wanted, a nice two-bedroom apartment. They had a fleet of cars. Soon, soon she was even starting to promise her family that she would fly them out there so they could see the life she chose for herself when she decided to marry David. Unfortunately, things back home with her mother were not good. She was really having issues of her own. Wayne and Phyllis finally separated ways and Phyllis had met somebody else and they were engaged to be married when an accident happened and her fiance passed. So Phyllis ended up turning to sex work in an effort to earn money. From a very young age, Phyllis learned that sex equaled money. This is something her father taught her. And men like her father were everywhere willing to pay. So Phyllis did what she needed to in order to make this new line of work work for her and the daughters that she still had at home. Sometimes the girls ended up being left to their own devices while she went out and turned a few tricks, making enough money just to get her to the next day. Other times she was taking them with her and leaving them in the car while she went and turned tricks. No one really knew how bad life had gotten for Phyllis because along with the lesson that money that sex equals money. She also learned how to hide what was really going on and she did it very well. The daughters that were still in her care, they are slowly starting to show signs of being neglected and uncared for. They would show up to school in clothes they wore days on end. They showed up not showering, their hair unkept, and they were starting to be bullied for it numerous parent-teacher meetings being called. It didn't do anything except become tedious until she started falling for the school's custodian and then she had a whole new outlook on them. Soon her and the custodian were dating and while he was cleaning the schools at night, Phyllis would keep him company and this meant the girls sat out in her car again until she, you know, they were done or Phyllis was tired. Phyllis just switched the direction of her attention and it wasn't from her job or lack thereof to her children who still needed it. No, it's a relationship. This relationship would only go on to last for a few years and it earned Phyllis two more children. Where Louise found an escape for sex from the sexual abuse she suffered from, her mother simply filled the void with even more and more men. Abuse that spanned decades plagued both David and Louise's families. Where one was from a demand of structure and obedience, the other was from a sexual predator who was allowed to keep abusing his victims over and over. These two coming together years later created a perfect recipe for abuse to grow and continue to plague them for another generation. Most people parent 
an adult out of spite, seeing how they were raised, seeing how their parents were, were, were raised, how their grandparents were raised. It afforded them the ability to see the errors and grow so that the same mistakes did not keep happening. For David and Louise, their outlook on life was strongly encouraged by their faith that was instilled in them from early on. The dark days for one were virtually daily. For the other, he only seemed to know the stories of what a bad day actually looked like. Neither David or Louise learned from their raising, or in David's case, the stories of what King Senior could be. Instead, their childhoods were the root of their poisoning, and the notion to have 12 children should have sparked fear and gave reason for caution for the young couple. Instead, the luxury of severing ties with their family only allowed that poison to grow and become all-consuming in the years ahead. Greed became the final ingredient in producing these two monsters, but their reign of terror wouldn't rear its ugly head until they earned the title Mom and Dad. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we embark on a new case, one filled with the seven deadly sins of lust, gluttony, pride, sloth, wrath, greed, and envy. And what we cover tonight is just the tip of the iceberg. Join me next week as we continue looking closely at the lives of David and Louise Turpin and watch how the past came back around and revealed two parents who looked picture perfect on the outside, but behind closed doors, they were the most black-hearted mom and dad to rise from their families to date. Don't forget to hit that like button or subscribe to the show so you never miss an upload. And if you haven't done so already, hit that review button or leave a comment on the show. Reviews and recommendations are the easiest way to show some love and support for TTCL without a dime leaving your pockets. If you suspect that a child is being abused or neglected, or if you are a child who is being mistreated, please call 1-800-422-4453 immediately. As always, I leave you with one last line. As long as greed is stronger than compassion, there will always be suffering. Much love, the true crime librarian.